Um, I'd like to now introduce our next speaker, um, Professor Tabitha Tsar of the University of Utah. Masood, I think you're muted. Um, I can't hear you. Uh, sorry. That's okay. Uh, we can hear you now. Thank yeah. you. Thank you very much for, uh, for the opportunity and thanks for the introduction. Uh, this, my talk is slightly different than uh, the ones we have seen so far. Uh, it is about uh, developing some uh, electronic sensors to detect COVID-19 from the environment and from saliva and bodily fluids. Uh, Dr. Elizabeth Middleton uh, from University Hospitals of um, University of Utah has provided the saliva samples and without her help, this wouldn't have been possible. And uh, this work is supported by, partially supported by an NSF CMMI rapid grant. Uh, so, as I mentioned, the objective was to develop something, a sensor that is very fast. So, in order to be able to do that, um, the idea uh, came across to develop a sensor that detects the whole virus and not decompose it to its constituents, like proteins, RNAs, and whatnot. Uh, and we wanted to be able to detect these uh, viruses uh, less in less than five minutes. So the sensor that I'm describing today is, is does it in about a minute. And um, and also it was desirable to have reusable sensors for a resource limited um, area so that we can reuse, reset the sensor and reuse it. Although there are some issues regarding contamination and cross uh, contaminations that prevents this from happening readily, um, unless you have some elaborate techniques to uh, reset them without uh, contaminating um, others. Um, so uh, if anybody's interested in uh, the stuff that I'm talking about, I sent in the chat uh, a link to all the news clips and stuff that cover uh, this uh, sensor development. And also Aaron Duffy, Dr. Aaron Duffy from our commercialization office can be contacted for, uh, for commercialization discussions. There are five companies that have uh, started commercializing this. So uh, saliva is actually pretty complex fluid. 99% of it's water, that 1% remaining has lots of nanoparticles in it. And I didn't know that before I started, like you know, most of the stuff that we do. Um, and, uh, and the, uh, there are nanoparticles that are completely different size than COVID-19. They're okay because they don't really um, contribute to the signal as long as they are much smaller than COVID-19 or much larger. So COVID-19, it takes different sizes in saliva. It's about 125 nanometer in diameter. And uh, directly competing with it are the exosomes in saliva. They're about 100 nanometer in diameter, so similar in size, and they're also spherical, but they do not have any spiking proteins that we are familiar with in COVID-19. So our sensor basically relies on three different things. <clears throat> this is the schematic of the sensor structure. These are optical um, microscope images uh, of uh, the sensor. Essentially, there are two electrodes that are separated from each other by a distance corresponding to the size of the COVID. And uh, the bottom gold electrode and the top gold electrode, they are, um, uh, they, have surf they have surface molecules on them that are called aptamers. These are single strand DNA, um, synthetically designed to bind with these spiking proteins on the surface of the COVID-19. Uh, and they uh, bind with S1 and S2. These are surface type one uh, proteins and surface type two proteins. So size is important. If it is too small or if it is too large, it won't really fit the, um, the sensor space in there. Uh, the spiking proteins are important. If they don't have it, you can wipe them out without uh, too much difficulty. Mm -hmm. And also the electrical properties of, um, of these viruses are also important because 
we measure the impedance of uh, this uh, junction, where you can call it the capacitor or whatever you want to call it. And if it is not COVID-19, then the impedance that you would measure would be different. So these three different things should come together for us to recognize something as the virus that we are interested in. Um, COVID-19 is also uh, uh, electrically charged. This is well known about viruses in different pH environment, they acquire different residual charge. In the case of COVID-19 and saliva, it is slightly negatively charged. You can um, see that if you perform these uh, current versus voltage measurements very carefully with electrodes, one side um, functionalized with aptamer and the other side not, you can see that this asymmetry and to explain this asymmetry, you have to assume that uh, COVID is a slightly negatively charged. We take advantage of that and put positive charge at the bottom electrode in our sensor in order to attract actively the, um, the virus to the sensor. Um, so once you have the sensor in place and all the aptamers and, and so on and so forth, uh, you can choose different ways of measuring the response of the sensor to the presence of the COVID-19. You can do current versus voltage measurement, those are DC measurements, or you can look at the capacitance and resistance of uh, the sensor and then try to see if the presence of COVID-19 uh, significantly contributes to the behavior of capacitance and resistance over certain range of frequencies. And at five kilohertz, the difference is largest between saliva that's infected and saliva that's not infected that are deposited on the sensor. Of course, the um, inductor capacitance resistance measurement units are 50K or so, and you can't really uh, do that uh, in a handheld device that you want to basically give people something like this uh, to carry with themselves to detect the uh, COVID in the environment. And we replace all those equipment with, uh, with a microprocessor that applies these square uh, pulses and uh, then we developed the technique to just look at the response of the, uh, of the sensor uh, to this output voltage that you have. And we have a reference capacitance that is comparable to the capacitance of the sensor. Um, and if the Vout uh, kind of looks like the red one that I show in there, then we decide that it is uh, the saliva is infected. And you can see the response of the negative and positive. There are a few samples that are kind of in the no man's land um, and uh, those are the false positives and false negatives that, um, that we account for. Now, <clears throat> the system is a standalone. There is a uh, um, LED that turns red when uh, the saliva is infected or it remains green. And this system is also paired, can be paired with your smartphone and uh, the output of the sensor can be uh, displayed. Uh, there is also a mapping capability that enables you to see where in the world uh, the sensor has been used. And if there are um, uh, infections detected, then there is this uh, you know, COVID-19 schematic or whatever uh, cartoon shows up. And there was one in Provo in, um, in Utah. And you can see that it is being tested in many different places, Japan and Thailand and, and uh, all over the world. Uh, now, detecting things from, uh, from airborne kind of version of the, detecting the airborne version of the COVID-19 is a little bit more challenging. The false positivity rates and negative rates are slightly higher because when you do it from airborne samples, there are soot particles in the air and so on and so forth that are similar in size. And one has to be careful about that. But still, um, we can detect it from airborne samples without um, without too much difficulty, although it needs more development to be able to, so that we can use it in, in the air rather than putting some saliva uh, samples on it. So these are some of the statistics or, or the characteristics of the, um, of the sensor. Our false positivity and negativity rates are between 4 and 10. It is better on the 4% side when you do it in the laboratory environment, again, because the sensor interacts with the environment and less stuff you have in the air, better it works. And uh, it detects the variants, but if the variants uh, have S1 and S2 proteins that are more than few percent different than the original one, then we have to change our aptamers. These are synthetically uh, produced, so they're easy to get and um, uh, employ and use it in our sensor. Our sensor system also has an oximeter and thermometer and 
walk sensor so uh, it can enable you to look at the um, toxic um, gases in the air, CO, CO2, stuff like that, that are also um, uh, become larger in infected people. That's basically it. Thank you very much.